welcome to Surrender School. This is the science of step one. So I just want to go over the caveats again. Remember, I told you I'm going to do it in every session. Um, I am not a medical doctor, scientist, or expert in the science of obesity and addiction. And I am not, not, not saying that my way is the right or best way to approach abstinence and food plans. And always check with your doctor before doing anything with your food plan or check with your nutritionist um, before doing anything with your food plan. Are there any questions on the last session before we get started today? Okay, here we go. So we are gonna start, remember our disease has two parts, the physical allergy and the mental obsession. We are gonna start in part one of the physical allergy. So we're gonna take the first half of our addiction and then I'm gonna talk about the first half of the first half, okay? And that is insulin and leptin and those are two hormones. Compulsive eaters often have an abnormal reaction to food. Some of us overindulge and can't quit, and then we crave more. That's from the OA 12 and 12. This is the physical allergy. Craving for more is the hallmark of our physical allergy. And let me tell you a story that illustrates for me, my physical allergy perfectly. Um, I had just moved to Phoenix um, and I was having a friend come in town. Um, I was really excited to see her. We had agreed we would have dinner together. She was there for a conference and we agreed we would have dinner together. We would meet um, in the evening. And so I picked a Greek restaurant because you can typically get like a Greek salad in, in a Greek restaurant. So it's, it's pretty abstinence, abstinent friendly. And so we met at the, at the restaurant and I was so excited to catch up with her and let her know about my new job. And I wanted to hear about her new job and da, 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 da. So I was all excited about it. And, and we, you know, squealed when we saw each other and we sat down at the table and we started talking and telling each other um, all about our lives and catching each other up. And then they handed us the menus. And I started looking over the menu and there was a lot of stuff on there that looked a lot better than a salad, right? So I chose not the salad. I chose something else and we started eating. And I became more and more interested in what I was eating than in sharing anything with her. They also set on the table. Now, this is quite common in Mexican food restaurants where they set the tortilla chips on the table, but they set pita chips on the table. Had the same effect that tortilla chips do for me. I mean, I just kept eating and kept eating and I kept getting hungrier and I kept getting hungrier and I wanted more and more food. And I was way less concerned about my friend and way more concerned about what food I, I could eat. What else can I eat? Got toward the end of the meal. And I'm like, I, I got to have something. I, I got to have more. I got to have dessert. I got to have dessert. So I talked her into eating dessert. By the time I got done with the dessert, I could not give a rat's patootie about my friend anymore. All I wanted to do was get out of there so I could get more binge food. That's all I cared about. And I did. I mean, I got out of there and I got binge food on the way home and, and I ate it on the way home and then ate more once I got home. Now, to me, that is a perfect example of the physical allergy to me. The craving takes over and becomes paramount. Nothing else matters but more of my substance. 
Now, the physiological basis of what happened, the biochemical basis of what happened occurred below my level of consciousness. I didn't make the decision, the conscious decision to ignore my friend and focus on my eating. My biochemistry made that decision for me. And so today we're going to take a look at the science behind this experience. So I'm going to start by going over the most fundamental part of our physical allergy. At its most basic, obesity is a disease of hormonal dysregulation. Hormones are very powerful chemical messengers in our bodies and brains. And they tell our organs and our cells, our, the cells in our body, what to do. They are in charge of our metabolism and our metabolic functioning. Hormones have a lot to do with eating behavior and fat storage. Hormones tell us when we're hungry. That's the hormone ghrelin, among many other hormones. Hormones tell us when we're full. These are the satiety hormones. These are leptin, peptide YY, amylin, and cholecystokinin. Calories make us burn less calories by decreasing the secretion of our thyroid hormone. Um, hormones make us burn more calories by increasing the secretion of our adrenaline hormone. Okay, so it's hormones that rule this, not willpower. So during the different sessions of this workshop, we're gonna talk about several different hormones that are messed up in our disease. But today we're gonna to talk about the two most important ones, and that is insulin and leptin. Now I'm gonna talk about them separately, but I want you to know that the two of them work very intricately together. And they work with two other brain systems that, are affect, that affect our disease, the lipostat and the satiety system. Again, I have to talk about them one at a time in order to explain them, but be clear that they all work together all the time, very intricately together. They take information from each other. Okay. So insulin is a hormone made in the pancreas. And whenever you hear the word insulin, the immediate thought that comes up is diabetes, right? And insulin is critical in diabetes, but it does a lot more than just have to do with that disease. It is critical in our disease of obesity and compulsive overeating and food addiction. Its job, insulin's job, is to move glucose. That's our blood sugar. Its job is to move up the sugar in our blood into our cells for energy and then to store any extra sugar we have as fat. So most importantly for us as food addicts and compulsive overeaters is insulin is the fat storage Hormone. I'm going to come back to this fact over and over and over again during this whole workshop. Insulin is the fat storage hormone. It's what stores fat on our body. Okay, so how is insulin supposed to work? The food we eat gets digested and the glucose or the sugar from our food is released into our bloodstream. Insulin is released into our bloodstream to move the sugar in our blood into our cells to make fuel. All of our cells, this is a cell, this is a cell. All of our cells have receptors for insulin. Here's a little insulin receptor. Insulin is like a key that unlocks the cell membrane. So here's insulin, it's a little key, it fits right into that receptor, okay? It fits like a key into a lock. When insulin unlocks the cell membrane, it allows glucose or blood sugar into the cell. 
So the, the insulin fits into the receptor on the cell and it opens up this channel right here to allow glucose into the cell. If there's no insulin in the receptor, this channel stays closed and no glucose gets into the cell. That's the way it's supposed to work. And when insulin's job is done, it's supposed to go back down to low levels in the bloodstream because it's done its work. It's not needed anymore. If there is more glucose in the bloodstream than the cells need, insulin will then drive our, that blood sugar, that glucose into our fat cells where it is metabolized and made into fat. So the glucose goes into our cells for fuel or into our fat, just in case we need it later. That's the way it's supposed to work. It's a very balanced system when it's working well. Our cells get the fuel they need and our levels of fat remain optimal on our bodies because we need a certain level of fat on our bodies to have them work properly. Our problem is we have too much. So obviously, this is not how this whole loop works for us. We have higher than normal levels of insulin floating around in our bodies all the time. Our insulin levels never go back down. High insulin levels are what drive the whole obesity train. It is the engine that keeps the physical allergy going. Obese people have much higher baseline or fasting insulin levels than normal weight people do. Our insulin levels are high whether we have food on board or not. We also, as obese people, secrete much higher levels of insulin in response to food than normal people do. So if you go to the Cheesecake Factory with your lean spouse and you both get a piece of cheesecake, you will have a higher spike in insulin than your lean spouse, even though you are eating exactly the same food, okay? That's another way that we are different. Also, like I said before, our level of insulin remains elevated or higher after a meal our level just doesn't drop naturally after a meal like it does for normal people. It remains high. Now remember, insulin is the fat storage hormone. And because of the overall higher level of insulin floating around in our bloodstream, we are super primed to make fat. We are fat making machines. And because of this higher level of insulin, we become insulin resistant. So how does this happen? How do we get this way? How do we become insulin resistant? Now, insulin resistant is not, does not equal diabetes. Diabetics are insulin resistant, but you can be insulin resistant without being diabetic. And often you become insulin resistant on your way to becoming diabetic. Some people never convert over into diabetes and they just remain insulin resistant. Okay, but those are not, diabetes and insulin resistance are not synonymous. Okay, so first, the, the process that happens here is we consistently flood our bodies with insulin because we overeat and binge on high calorie, high sugar, high carbohydrate, high starch food, okay? We, we aren't binging on this. We aren't binging on healthy food. This should be a picture of binge food is what it should be. Um, and then, so we, we're, we're filling our bodies with sugar, okay? So our blood sugar rises. In response, we have all this insulin being secreted so our poor bodies are drowning in insulin and our bodies try and compensate and bring things back into balance. It doesn't want us to have high levels of sugar or high levels of insulin. 
So our bodies want to be in what is called homeostasis. Homeostasis is a state of balance between all of our different body systems so that our body works properly. Whenever anything's out of balance, it throws everything off, okay? And so our body desperately tries to get us back into balance. The way our bodies do that is that it, it makes us resistant to insulin. So in order to deal with all of this insulin floating around, it decreases the number of receptors, those little locks on our cells. It decreases the number of receptors for insulin to get into, to hook onto our cells. That way the cells are protected from getting too much glucose. But, and this is an important part, the combination of our of the decreased insulin receptors on our cells and our continued overeating and binging on high sugar, high starch foods leads to our body having to increase the amount of insulin we actually secrete in order to deal with the high levels of blood sugar. So our body wants to take the sugar and, and get it back down to a normal level. It does that by secreting insulin and putting that sugar into our cells or into our fat cells. But in order to deal with that, and it does it by secreting insulin. So if the cells become insulin resistant because we have so much insulin around, the body needs to decrease the amount of insulin to protect the cells from too much glucose it's all out of whack, okay? And so we are continuing to binge. Our bodies have to produce more and more insulin to deal with all of that sugar while our cells are making themselves insulin resistant. And it just goes on and on and on. And we keep creating more and more fat because the, the sugar in our blood has to go somewhere. It has to get out of our blood. All of the complications of diabetes and the bad things that happen with diabetes is because there's too much sugar in the blood and it damages our organs and our cells. And so it, it needs to get, our body needs to get the sugar out. So what it does is since it can't store it in the cells because the cells are resistant, it automatically stores it into our fat cells. And we just are primed to make more and more and more fat. And our cells don't get, in the later stages of insulin resistance, they don't get the actual fuel they need. And we feel really tired and really hungry. And that makes us eat more food. And so it's like this nonstop cycle. Now you'd think, Okay, just a second, I'm sorry. So this is a self-perpetuating cycle. More insulin leads to insulin resistance and insulin resistance leads to more insulin being secreted, which leads to more insulin and on and on and on and on. And we make more and more and more fat. I don't know about you, but it felt like in the progression of my disease, it's almost like a switch flipped and I started to pack on the pounds so much faster than I ever had before. And I think that this process, this insulin resistance process was at play for me in that. Okay, so the first part of our physical allergy is insulin resistance, okay? Because of our binging. Now that I said a lot, and all you really need to know about insulin is insulin is the fat storage hormone. Obese food addicts and compulsive overeaters have much higher levels of insulin than normal weight people because of insulin resistance. And this insulin resistance makes us fat making machines. Those are the only thing you need to know about insulin. Are there any questions on insulin before I move on? Okay, I'm going to move on then. All right. 
So now we're going to talk about the other half of the main driver of our physical allergy, leptin. Leptin is a hormone that is secreted by our actual fat cells. It is a major satiety hormone. That is, it signals our brain that we are full and we don't need to eat anymore. It signals our brain to lose interest in food and to get up off the couch and get moving. When leptin is working normally, it travels to the brain to turn down hunger and prevent more fat storage. Leptin is the way our brain knows how much stored energy, fat, we have on our bodies. Humans, like I said before, need a baseline percentage of fat for optimal health. And so the brain is tracking and how much fat is on our bodies. And leptin is the way that it does it because leptin comes from our fat cells. And that's the way our brain knows how much fat we have on us. Now, you'd think as food addicts with plenty of fat on our bodies, we would be drowning in, in leptin. And we are. So why doesn't it work? It doesn't work because we are leptin resistant. Our leptin never reaches our brains to shut off our feelings of hunger. When the brain doesn't register or see leptin, it believes we are starving. And I mean, literally starving. Our brain isn't seeing how much fat we have on our bodies. It thinks we have zero fat stores, which is a serious threat to our survival. So it tells us to eat everything in sight and to conserve energy by being a couch potato. How does this happen? It is because of our insulin resistance. Insulin blocks leptin in our brain because these two hormones use the same signaling pathway in our brain. Excess insulin gunks up or clogs up the pathway so that the leptin doesn't reach our brain. Our insulin resistance causes our leptin resistance. Now remember, first and foremost, leptin is secreted by our fat cells to keep our brain informed about how much fat we have on our bodies, right? Okay, that's the first biggest thing that leptin does. But leptin is also secreted by our stomach after we eat to tell our brain that we've eaten enough energy at a specific meal. So it kind of measures the amount of energy we're actually eating in this food. And then when we've had enough, it tells our brain let this the leptin that's secreted by the stomach tells our brain, okay, she's eaten enough for this meal. You can have her stop eating. Okay. So weirdly, obese people's brain level of leptin actually falls after eating instead of going up. This leads to a feeling of starving after we've started eating. We get hungrier after eating than we were before we even started eating. That's one of the reasons why overeating and binging triggers more overeating and binging. That's why after my big meal at the restaurant, I couldn't wait to ditch my friend and get something more to eat. That's why at Thanksgiving, your family's on the couch in a food coma and you're in the kitchen eating leftovers. This is one of the reasons why we never feel full. This is why I ate past feeling full. I ate past feeling sick. I ate past feeling pain. And I only stopped when either I ran out of food or I literally couldn't fit one more thing in my stomach. Insulin resistance and leptin resistance become a nonstop cycle for us. They are our nonstop cycle of the physical allergy. Insulin overeating, excuse me, overeating and binging leads to insulin resistance, 
which leads to leptin resistance, which leads to more overeating and binging, which leads to more insulin resistance, and over and over and on and on. Okay, it's a self-perpetuating cycle for us. So this is one way that insulin resistance and leptin resistance work in our disease. They keep us eating and they keep us making fat. But insulin resistance and leptin resistance also work in another way to keep us in our disease and prevent us from losing weight. So all you need to know, again, I said a lot, all you need to know about leptin is it's the way our brain knows how much stored energy or fat we have on our bodies. And when our brain doesn't see or register leptin, it thinks we are literally starving and it does everything it can to get us to eat as much as we can. And it does it biochemically. And we'll be talking about that in the rest of the workshop. Are there any questions on leptin before I go on? There is one that mm -hmm. combines um, leptin with insulin. Mm -hmm. Is that what produces food neutrality when they're working good? It is. That's an excellent question. That is one of the things when, when they are regulated, when they are in regulation with each other, that is part of why we, we have food neutrality when we've worked out that, that dysregulation and, and it's working healthy again. So yes, that's a good question, yeah. Can you be born with both insulin and leptin working improperly? Let me think about that. Um, I'm not sure, I don't. I don't think so because you you will you are born with um, like genetic susceptibility to these processes. Like we're we're more susceptible than you know someone who doesn't have our disease. So we can be born with the susceptibility, but I don't think we are born with that dysregulation right away. It can happen right away, depending on what you are fed as a baby. Um, it can happen right away. Um, like with, you know, probably within a few months, um, you can probably become dysregulated like that, depending on what you're fed. But I don't think, and, and, I don't know, because I've not read anything on this. This is my uneducated guess to the answer to that question. What happens when we stop eating sugar? Sugar equals insulin secretion. So when we stop eating sugar, we, we stop blasting the, our blood with all that glucose, all that sugar. So then we don't have to blast this big, large amount of insulin to take care of that big, large amount of sugar. So, and I'll talk more specifically at the end about, um, you know, my food plan and, and you know, for this issue and, and why I eat the way I do because I'm trying to deal with this dysregulation, this leptin and insulin dysregulation. But if you, de if you don't eat sugar, now, insulin is secreted, um, it, it, insulin is secreted with protein, the ingestion of protein, and insulin is secreted um, with starches, you know, like grains and um, carbohydrate, um, like that. It's secreted for that as well. Um, fat, there is no insulin secretion for fat. Um, so, I hope that answers the question. Uh, you stated that insulin blocks leptin. So mm -hmm. we never get the message that we're full. Is that what we hear sometimes in meetings as the bridge being broken? Yeah, that's a great way. I've not heard that analogy, but that's a great analogy. The bridge is broken. Yeah, we never feel full. That's a great analogy. Yeah. Okay. Can you take leptin medication to try to regulate this? 
Okay, that's a good question too. It's not that we don't have enough leptin. We have too much. The problem isn't wouldn't be solved by adding more leptin because we already have a crap load. The problem is that our brain doesn't see it. There, there is a genetic condition that people can be born with where they don't have enough leptin um, and an injection of leptin takes care of that for them. Um, but that's not our story. Our story happens in the brain. And so we have to get the insulin and leptin feedback loop um, re-regulated for us. And we do that through our abstinence and our food plan. There's there's no easy pill for that one. They When they first discovered the hormone leptin in the early 1990s, they thought it was the obesity holy grail. And they were going to be able to... Um, they were going to be able to make these leptin pills or shots and there was going to be no more obesity anymore, but didn't work that way. Insulin and leptin work with something called the lipostat to keep us eating and to keep us fat. The lipostat is located in the hypothalamus in the brain. It determines how much fat your body should store, how much it thinks you should store to be in optimal health because again, we have to have an optimal amount of fat on our bodies to be in good health for everything to work properly. So think about the thermostat in your home. You set your thermostat at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The thermostat will keep track of the temperature of the house. If the temperature falls below 70 degrees, the thermostat will turn on the furnace. Your lipostat works in kind of the same way. It keeps track of the amount of fat on your body and drives you to eat more if you fall below that level of fat that it has set. Of course, in our disease, this system is also dysregulated. Our high levels of insulin push the setting on our lipostat higher. So instead of being set at 70 degrees, it's set at 90 degrees. The furnace just keeps pumping out more heat. We keep eating. When our lipostats are set too high due to our insulin and leptin resistance, our brain sets the optimal level of for body fat higher, and it will do anything and everything it can to maintain that higher level of body fat on our bodies because it thinks that that's what we need to be in good health. It will fight tooth and nail to keep us fat and prevent us from losing weight. It does this by regulating both our hunger hormones and our satiety or fullness hormones. It increases the secretion of the hormones that make us feel hungry, and it decreases the secretion of the hormones that make us feel full or satiated. It also makes us burn less calories by slowing our overall metabolic rate. So the whole cycle in a nutshell works like this. We eat tons of sugar, highly processed food, junk food, fat, starch, all the refined carbs. This causes high levels of insulin secretion, which eventually leads to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance leads to leptin resistance, which leads to more binging. All this drives up our lipostat setting, which leads our bodies to defend against and mightily resist fat and weight loss. So all you need to know about the lipostat is that it sets the fat temperature for our bodies, how much fat it thinks we need on our bodies to be healthy. Food addicts and compulsive overeaters lipostats are set too high because of our insulin resistance. And this keeps us eating and prevents us from losing weight. Are there any questions on the lipostat before I go on? The lipostat, is it an, a gland? or a hormone, or what is it exactly? Okay, so a, a lipos, the, our lipostat is like a cluster of neurons in our brain. It's a cluster of brain cells. 
Um, and I can't be any more detailed than that because I don't understand any more than that. Um, it, but it's it's a cluster of cells. It's not a hormone. It's and it's not a gland. It's a cluster of cells in our brain. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. The satiety system is a system in the brain that registers when we've had enough food and it stops us from eating more. This system works in conjunction with the lipostat. And it, and it does this typically through the secretion or the non-secretion of different hormones, different satiety hormones or fullness hormones. That's the way the satiety system works. So the fact that your non-addict friends can eat two bites of a dessert, push it away and continue a conversation with someone in a restaurant has nothing to do with willpower. It just means their satiety system is working correctly and ours is not. So the satiety system makes the decision if we've eaten enough by taking in information from three different areas, the digestive tract, the brain reward system in our brain, and we'll be talking about that in the fourth session, and the lipostat. So it takes information from the digestive tract, the brain reward system, and the lipostat. So first, it gets information from the digestive tract, mostly through volume, the amount the actual physical volume of what you eat. And it also takes information from your digestive tract from the amount of protein you're eating and the amount of fiber you're eating, that the fiber and protein content in your food. So the satiety system asks, is there enough volume, fiber, and protein in this meal to be full? If not, you're not full, keep eating. It, the satiety system also receives information from the reward system in our brain, the system that gives us our effect that the big book talks about. The satiety system shuts down the feeling of satiety and fullness when we eat really highly rewarding binge foods that give us our effect, like pizza, ice cream, and donuts. That means we can eat a lot more. Well, actually, that means that we can eat a whole apple pie, which is highly rewarding. We all love it or whatever prop pie you love. But we have trouble eating five whole apples. So the question for the satiety system is, is highly rewarding binge food available right now? If so, you're not full, keep eating. That's why if there is an unfinished carton of ice cream in the freezer or an unfinished bag of chips in the cupboard, it's around. Our satiety system knows that that highly rewarding food system is around and it keeps us eating. The satiety system also gets important information from our lipostat, that cluster of cells in our brain. The lipostat decreases our feelings of fullness to help maintain the fat stores on our body according to the set point that it has set. And remember, ours is set too high. So the lipostat tells the satiety system if it thinks we have enough stored fat on our body. So the question is, does the lipostat think we have enough fat on our bodies? If not, you're not full, keep eating, okay? All you need to know about the satiety system is it will keep us eating if our meals don't have enough volume, fiber, or protein and protein content. It will keep us eating if we are eating highly rewarding calorie dense foods. And it will keep us eating if our lipostat fat setting is too high. Are there any questions on the satiety system before we go on? So now the good news is that the hormonal dysregulation and dysfunction of our disease can be corrected. 
we can reverse our insulin and leptin resistance, which will affect our lipostat and our satiety system. And we do this through our abstinence and our food plans. So most of the obesity experts that I read believe that the number one thing we need to do to lose weight and re-regulate our hormonal system is to bring down our insulin levels, to lower our fasting baseline insulin levels that we have floating around all the time. Because remember, insulin is the fat storage hormone. So this is where I started in when I developed my food plan. Um, not my abstinence, my food plan. I figured out what my abstinence was by figuring out what my alcoholic foods were. Um, my abstinence is about the foods that produce craving for me, like the big book talks about. Those are the substances I have to keep out of my body or I will start the disease process like the big book talks about so eloquently. Um, my food plan is just a tool I use to lose weight and then maintain that weight loss. So I wanted my food plan to help me drive down my levels of insulin to reverse my insulin resistance so my leptin could be read by my brain and the setting on my lipostat could be turned down and my, my satiety system would work better and I would actually be able to feel full. Please, as I go through this, please, please, please understand that I am not saying you should follow my food plan. I'm not telling you that this is the one and only true food plan. This is not a magical food plan. There is no such thing. Don't get lost in the specifics of the food. Okay, there is no magical food plan. There just isn't. So I'm going to go over my food plan. Okay. Oops, that was questions. If, okay, so here's my strategies to manage insulin leptin dysregulation through a food plan. Okay, this is what I did. First and foremost, obviously, I eliminated all sugars from my diet. White, brown, liquid, honey, agave, brown rice syrup, any kind, any kind of sugar I eliminated. And for obvious reasons, right? And that's part of both my abstinence because sugar is an alcoholic food for me. And it's part of my food plan because sugar messes with my insulin secretion. I also eliminated all artificial sweeteners. Now, artificial sweeteners don't make you secrete tons of insulin like actual sugar does, but it does make you secrete a little bit of insulin. It's called the cephalic phase insulin secretion. And that is that it's not the gut um, and the blood telling the uh, our pancreas to secrete insulin. It's our brains because it tastes a sweet taste in our mouth that's telling us to secrete some insulin. So some insulin is secreted in response to just the sweet taste in your mouth. The brain says, uh-oh, we got sugar coming, so let's get ready for it. But it's not really coming because it's, it's the artificial sweetener. So I did it for that reason, but I also did it because artificial sweeteners are an alcoholic food for me because they make me crave more. I don't know if that's true for everybody else, but it is true for me. Artificial sweeteners make me crave more. I also eliminated um, all highly processed food, including flour. Starch turns into glucose or sugar when it is digested, okay? And, and that glucose from the starch makes insulin secretion. So I keep my starch levels low to keep my blood glucose levels low so I can keep my insulin levels lower. Processing increases the surface area of the starch. And this produces a bigger load of sugar in our blood all at once. 
because it's digested all at once. Okay, so it causes a bigger spike in sugar, which causes and requires a bigger spike in insulin to deal with all that sugar in our blood. So I will eat grains, but I eat them in the whole form. So what's ground up to make flour, our wheat flour, our wheat berries, that's a whole grain. It's an actual little wheat berry and you can cook them and it takes a very long time to, to cook them. It's like cooking up dry beans. It takes a long time. Um, but what's wrapped up in those wheat berries is fiber and some germs, a little bit of oil. And all of that slows down the digestion of that starch so that it doesn't create a blood spike, which then necessitates an insulin spike. So it just digested slower. Um, I don't eat, I only eat one grain a day in, in my food plan. Um, and, and that was done specifically because, um, I don't want to spike my insulin. So, but I do have, I do eat a grain. I eat my fruits whole, no juices, no smoothies, nothing like that. I eat them whole. For the same reason as that I will eat a wheat berry, but I won't eat flour. I don't want to, to make all of that sugar in the fruit available in my bloodstream all at once because it'll cause a glucose spike or a blood sugar spike, which requires an insulin spike. And I'm trying to keep my insulin down. So when I eat my fruits, I eat them whole. And I, I do eat three fruits a day. Um, I keep my food tame and uh, really predictable. I don't eat sexy, um, glitzy food. I don't pour over recipe books for all kinds of different things. I eat basically the same thing every day. Um, I change out what fruits I eat. I change out what vegetables I eat. I change out what proteins I eat. Um, I typically have the same fats. Um, but I keep it very tame. I don't, if, if you like, I enjoy my meals, but I don't think about when I get to sit down to dinner. Okay. I just sit down to dinner and I enjoy the meal naturally, but it's, it's not a, oh, I get to have dinner. Okay. It's not, my food isn't like that. Um, and I keep it that way on purpose because that will just trigger more eating for me. I increased um, the level of protein in my diet because it acts directly in the hypothalamus to lower my fatness set point. It also decreases hunger and prevents some of the reduction in energy expenditure, like the calories that I burn just basically um, that comes from uh, being on a weight loss food plan. For example, when we get on a weight loss food plan, our body is trying to protect us from losing weight. It doesn't want us to do that. And so it will decrease our energy expenditure or our metabolic rate. Um, so, you know, when you get cold, when you're kind of cold, when you're losing weight, that's evidence of um, energy expenditure decretion. It, it our decrease in our metabolic rate. And so with a little bit more protein, that um, helps keep us burning a little bit more calories just with normal bodily functioning. It also, protein also um, helps with that whole uh, lipostat setting. Like if we don't have enough protein in our meal, our lipostat will say, or our satiety system, I'm sorry. Let me back up so I don't confuse you. Getting a little bit more protein makes us feel fuller. We've all seen that on TikTok or whatever, but that's really true. It does help us to feel a little bit fuller. It the One of the things that our satiety system is looking for is an appropriate amount of protein in our meal. If we don't get enough, it will keep us eating. I hope I didn't confuse that too much. Okay, so um, I there is so much controversy 
on how much protein you should be eating. I mean, it, there is a lot of controversy on that. What I did for myself is I try and get about a half a gram of protein to three quarters of a gram of protein um, per pound of body weight per day. So a 120 pound person, I would try and make it between 60 grams of protein to, well, anywhere between like 60 grams of protein and 70 grams of protein. I'm trying to keep it in there. You don't want to eat too much protein because that's very hard on the kidneys. Um, so I, I try and keep it between 60 and 70 grams of protein a day to keep my satiety system working without damaging my kidneys. Um, okay. I also weigh and measure my food. I weigh and measure my food um, because even if it's abstinent food, if I eat too much of it, I'm going to have insulin spikes because I'm eating too many calories, okay? It, it, I'm eating too much energy. So it will require an insulin spike to deal with. So I weigh and measure as a way to keep um, my insulin levels lower. And I weigh and measure because it decreases the amount of chatter in my head, um, food chatter in my head. Now, for some people, weighing and measuring increases the chatter in their head. And if that's true, then I would suggest you not do it. But for me, it helps my brain quiet down. And so that and so that's another reason that I do it. Now, I'm going to tell you the last thing that I do for my food plan. Um, and the last thing that I do is fasting. I do intermittent fasting. I do not want to imply that I think everyone should fast because I don't. Um, Anyone that has any history of anorexia and probably bulimia should not do this. Um, I, that's not part of my story, and I don't know the I don't know the biochemistry of um, anorexia and bulimia. I, I I don't know it. I only know what I looked up for myself, and it was obesity is what I looked up for myself. So intermittent fasting is a way to decrease insulin levels because if you don't have food, you don't have insulin secretion. Um, so that was the way that I, I did that. That was another thing I did. If you are interested in doing it, there are two books that I highly recommend that you read. Um, now, uh, the way that I do it is I do two 24 hour fasts a week. And I have done that. I do that now. I've been doing that at a maintained body weight for about two years. Um, so that, and that's just, that's the way I keep my insulin levels lower. And it's, there's also some side benefits on longevity and chronic disease and stuff like that, but that's outside of the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, the way I do the fasting is, for example, on Monday, I will eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then I won't eat again until dinner the next day, which is 24 hours later. So that way, I don't go without eating for a full day because I ate three meals one day and I eat one meal the next day. Um there are people that advocate for 36 hour fasts and I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have a meal. I didn't want to go an entire day without eating an entire, I don't know, wake, wakeful day without eating because half of, well, a little less than a third of the time that I'm fasting for that 24 hour fast, I'm asleep. And so it makes it a little bit easier too. Um, if you are interested in fasting, I would recommend two books before you do anything. And I would also recommend you check with your doctor um, before doing any of that, because that will affect medications and everything. 
But if you want more information on fasting, there are two books, and I'm going to tell them to you right now. The first one is The Obesity Code. The Obesity Code by Jason Fung, F-U-N-G, Jason Fung. And I just recently listened to a book on fasting, although she takes it further than I would. Um, it's called The Essential Guide to Intermittent Fasting for Women. It's The Essential Guide to Intermittent Fasting for Women. And the author of that is Megan Ramos. R-A-M-O-S, Megan Ramos. She worked with Dr. Fung. Um, she works, I think, in his clinic. Um, Dr. Fung is a physician and she, she's not a physician. But um, So the next time we're going to be talking about another aspect of our physical allergy, and that's the starvation response and how to, how to manage it. See you next week.